So we are about to commence our final panel of the day, which is designed to address the topic of the raising the professional bar, the abacus professions model. Uh, this panel will be chaired by Rob Carrick. Rob has been writing about personal finance and business and economics for more than 20 years. He joined the Globe and Mail in, in late 1996 as an investment reporter and has been a personal finance columnist since November of 1998. Rob's personal finance columns appear on Tuesdays and Thursdays of each week and his portfolio strategy column for investors appears every Saturday. Rob is the host of Let's Talk Investing video series and he writes a daily blog called Carrick on Money. He's the author or co-author of five books, the most recent being How Not to Move Back In With Your Parents. <laughs> I might want to read that myself, Rob. <laughs> the Young Person's Complete Guide to Financial Empowerment. Rob, please come forward and start our panel. Well, I hope, this, uh, I hope this is half as lively as the previous, uh, the previous session, which, as a spectator, I thoroughly enjoyed. It was a good show. Uh, we'll try and give you something almost as good. You know, as personal finance columnist at the Globe Mail, I'm sort of in a unique position. I'm sort, of, I'm sort of halfway between you people and your clients. I'm between the industry and its clients, between regulators and the investors. And I think I have a unique point of view in it all. I, I, I have the ear of everybody, you, you could say. Um, but readers don't contact newspaper personal finance columnists to praise their advisors or to tell regulators what a good job they're doing. I sort of he I hear from the roadkill out there. <laughs> and I hear enough about these people and their stories for me to say that I am entirely behind any initiative that is going to professionalize uh, what advisors do. Uh, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to just read you a little excerpt from an email I got from a, from a woman last week, just to sort of, I think this will nicely set the tone for what we, what, uh, what's urgent about professionalization. She goes, Dear Rob, I have read many of your articles on finance and sincerely hope you can help me. I'm in a situation where I have been seriously misled and taken advantage of by my current advisor. He promised me the sun, moon and stars, convinced me not to pay off my mortgage because, because he could generate returns that were higher promised a minimum 10% return, etc. Since 2006, my portfolio is exactly the same as it was, no gain whatsoever. Hard to believe, I know. Do I sound like an idiot? Yes, I realize I do, but I now know more than I did seven years ago. I'm actually a VP at a respected publishing company, so it does seem surprising that I allowed this to happen, but it did. Interesting, she's blaming herself there. Um, Let's talk about the professional qualifications or advisors that might help uh, provide someone like this better advice on her next go-round. Uh, let me introduce the panel who's going to uh, go over these issues with me. We'll start with um, Susan Ng. Susan is Vice President for Adv Advocacy at CARP, the national nonpartisan, nonprofit organization committed to advocating for social change that will bring financial security, equitable access to health care, and freedom from discrimination to all Canadians as we age. Uh, also on the panel is uh, Jerry Matier. Jerry has been the Executive Director of the Insurance Council of British Columbia since September 1991. The Insurance Council is the primary regulator in the province responsible for over 30,000 persons involved in the distribution of insurance products. Jerry has twice served as the Chair of the Canadian Insurance Services Regulatory Organizations and sits on a number of national committees involving the insurance industry. Greg Pollock. Greg is the president and CEO of Advocus. At Advocus, Greg is responsible for providing effective strategic leadership and, and direction. He oversees all aspects of Advocus's day-to-day -day activities, including advocacy, continuing education, best practices, and E&O insurance. And finally, John Wilkinson. John Wilkinson was, the first, was first elected to the Ontario Legislature in 2003 as the MPP for Perth Middlesex, and in 2007 was re-elected as the MPP for Perth Wellington. During his second term, John served as Minister of Research and Innovation, then as Minister of Revenue, and finally as Minister of the Environment. John lives in Stratford, Ontario, where he founded Wilkinson and Keller Financial Planning Limited. John is also the owner of Wilkinson Insight Incorporated, which offers his unique insight on a wide range of topics through public speaking engagements, post-secondary lectures, uh, to select clients. Now, um, 
questions. You're invited to ask questions all through this session. Um, write them down, put up your hands, someone will gather them up and bring them up and if they're interesting I'll put them right into the course of the conversation or we can save them to the end. But uh, I'll, I have a couple of questions I'd like to get started but I welcome, I welcome your input and like I say don't hesitate to, to jump right in. Um, first thing I want to get at is the, the, we're talking about professionalizing, we're talking about raising the bar. <clears throat> I want to talk about how far we are from where we are now to where the bar is. And Greg, I wonder if you can get us going uh, by explaining how much work you see ahead of us to turn advisors into true professionals. Sure, thanks Rob for the, uh, the question. Um, I, I think we're a ways, to be, to be candid. Uh, we, uh, as we look out there you know, across the landscape, uh, we see quite a few uh, standards being applied to the work that financial advisors are doing. Uh, question is, you know, who are financial advisors? You know, we would see those as, as individuals uh, on the, the IROC platform, on the MFDA platform, uh, selling uh, life and health insurance products in the country, uh, individuals providing uh, pension advice uh, in the country. So uh, a lot of them are operating uh, by different standards and what we would like to see is a, 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 an organization uh, in place responsible for the day-to-day uh, the -day oversight of that group of individuals. And so while we might uh, term, them, term them all as financial advisors, uh, we would also, I would think, see specialization uh, within, within that group. So for example, uh, financial planners. I'm, I'm a CFP uh, and uh, you know, I might have a, a specialization of financial planning, let's say, within that overall uh, financial advice uh, sector. So I think we're a ways from that. I think we need to, uh, we need to establish uh, a body that would see oversight of, of these in individuals and the way professions are structured in Canada it's on a provincial basis so this would have to be done province by province by province and uh, you can imagine just uh, doing that in and of itself is, is going to be a huge undertaking so, so it's time to start we uh, floated a paper uh, just about a year ago on raising the professional bar I hope a lot of people in the audience have, have seen it we can talk a little bit about it uh, in the next uh, hour or so but uh, that's a beginning and uh, we want to see that uh, movement in that direction over time. Okay, that, you've set the landscape nicely, and I'd like to turn over to Susan now to get sort of more a consumer's eye view on this. Susan, what do you think advisors need to do to become uh, professionals or more professional? Well, thank you very much, Rob. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our members. Uh, CARP has 300,000 members across the country, your clients. And uh, our members are retired teachers, university professors, they're doctors, they're lawyers. We probably have a rocket scientist among the bunch of them. But when it comes to your profession, they really, all of them, are babes in the woods. In the sense that they really are handing over to you one of their most important assets. And frankly, if they knew really how to handle the profession, they try to do it themselves. When I was in practice, I would often have people say, let's just give me a copy of the documents, I'll do it myself and for my family, save on your fees. And I would say to them, you know what, I won't do my own brain surgery, you don't do your own tax planning. So it's, it's the kind of thing where we have a concurrence, a <coughs> contract between us as to what it is that the professional does and what it is that the client is entitled to expect. And frankly, most of our members as clients already think there's a best interest standard in place. They already, already think and want there to be a professional model and accountability. So we're trying to play, play catch up. In this, in this environment, there is a great deal of confusion. You can just imagine if you have difficulty keeping all of the different designations and self-regulatory organizations straight, you can imagine what it must appear to the average retail investor. And who, after all, you know, I, I, uh, I taught at the bar ads and this lawyers actually got to the graduating class without ever taking tax. They were just miserable about the idea. So you have lots of people who avoid that whole area of financial planning, discussion, and all of that. So that's who your client is. Your client is a group of people who have a bit of money to invest with you. They are educated in their own professions. That's not the concern. The question is whether or not they're educated in your profession. And that's where they do have a great deal of reliance. They do expect a certain amount of accountability. And I think it's time to, to actually close that expectation gap. Jerry, I wonder if you could uh, jump into this. The, um, 
there's this group of advisors here. They do business the way they do business. Um, there's this position paper that Advocus has put out about professionalizing advisors. What do you think uh, needs to be done differently in terms of uh, bringing a professional uh, aspect to what, what, what everybody in this room does? Uh, <coughs> well, I think there is a professionalism in the industry. I mean, we license, I think, about 13,500 life agents just in British Columbia alone. Um, if I were to ask in the room how many people here were life agents, I'd be interested in seeing how many hands came up. And then from there, how many of them already have designations or are working on designations. The bar at that level, the people who've made this a career and are taking the courses, the professionalism is very high. Uh, where I see the challenges, you know, and again, I'm, I'm only limited to the life insurance side of things, is, is the bar coming into the industry, the level of which it takes to come into the industry, uh, and what you have to do once you're in, which is pretty well nothing. Um, we have continuing education requirements in British Columbia. Most jurisdictions don't, um, or some of the jurisdictions don't. Um, you know, we raised the initial bar in 2000, I guess it was, from the old entry level exam to the current one we have in place, and we're now reviewing that one again. But once you've done that, in most jurisdictions, you are free to act as a life insurance agent. Uh, those who, who make the effort and go forward, um, get a designation, and I think bring the true professionals into the industry. Uh, the report that's come out from Advocus, I was, I was just speaking about it, uh, we published a report back in 1998 that pretty well mirrors what's being said by Advocus, is that there should be more. There should be a requirement that you have to get a designation, that you have to be supervised. There has to be training. It's this, it's this period from the time somebody gets a license till the, the time they realize they want to do this as a career. And that's usually about five years, and it depends on a lot of other factors than just education, of course. Um, but I think that's where we need to be saying more needs to be done at that level to bring the bar up so that everybody is going to this professional level and, and getting an appropriate designation. Now, you've mentioned the word designations a whole bunch of times, and that segues nicely into my next question. Uh, I was reading the Advocates paper on, um, on raising the bar, and I think eight different designations were mentioned, uh, CFP, RFP, uh, several, uh, um, several insurance-related ones. Um, the accounting profession, as I'm sure a lot of you probably noted, have just merged three designations into one. Um, and one sounds great for me as, as a consumer. I mean, I don't know what all those initials mean. I don't know. I mean, that's eight pieces of research I'm unlikely to do uh, with eight different designations. John, how many designations should we have? Well, I, I agree with raising the bar about the need for uh, designation, but I would say this problem. As someone who was in the industry and who was in the government, have seen people who purport to be professionals to see how uh, regulated professions are dealt with versus self-regulated professions. The definition is simply this. Can you throw the bums out? Right? If you're a bad lawyer, you get thrown out. You know who throws you out? The law society. If you're a bad surgeon, you know who throws you out? The other doctors. If you want to be a doctor, all the other doctors have to agree that you're meeting the standard. You don't meet the standard, you get thrown out. You know, there was a, a tragic case a, a couple of years ago where a surgeon made a, a mistake. Uh, you know, the, the surgeon was in trouble. The hospital was in trouble. But nobody went to the Minister of Health and said, it's your fault. Because the minister said, I'm sure the College of Physicians and Surgeons is going to deal with that surgeon. When a, when a lawyer steals money from a trust account, right, it's not the Attorney General that deals with it. It's the Law Society. In our industry, when somebody is a bum, when somebody misuses their trust, when we use the position that we have to convince a senior that they need to do something and sign these papers, they're doing it because they trust us. And if someone misuses that trust, they need to be thrown out. Now, either they're gonna be thrown out after the fact by the regulator, because that's the only thing they can do, set a standard to get in, and then deal with all the damage afterwards, or you set up a system that says, by the way, if you get thrown out, you're out of work. You're not going to find some other little weasel hole to go jump into with some other jurisdiction. You're going to go that if you say that you're in this business, you're going to meet this standard, and if you screw up, you're out. And that, in my world, that's what a profession is. And, and if we don't go to that standard, I, I don't think we're going to solve this problem. And that's why consumers are unhappy, which we heard in spades today about how consumers who have felt that, they, that, that, that their trust was misplaced are telling all the other potential customers, don't deal with these people. So I, that's, that's kind of my take on it. 
Susan, you look like you want to jump in. Yes, there is a hierarchy of interest by the average investor. Um, they may want to make sure that that fraudulent advisor or negligent advisor not be able to work again, but their first interest <coughs> is getting their money back. And at the present time, there's no direct and easy path for people to make that case. Um, and that's where, what we have to do. We have to draw a straight line that starts with some obligation on the investor to educate him or herself about the various aspects and not sort of expect to throw themselves uh, in front of an advisor and say, here, save me, make me lots of money. No, they have some obligation to have some understanding of the industry as well. But beyond that, they need to expect that the profession itself will govern itself so that in addition to ensuring a level of standards of the average uh, advisor, they don't have to all be superstars, they just need to be straight and honest and do a fair job, that if they go offside, that there is redress for them and rehabilitation for the advisor, whether additional training, discipline, and ultimately losing the right to work. These things actually don't exist in, in a plain and simple way right now, and most of our members and your clients think it already does. Mm -hmm. uh, as part, part, uh, part of the preparation for this session, I did a little research on the Law Society of Upper Canada's website, and I looked at the enforcement section, and wow, yes. there's a lot of people being enforced upon. Uh, they're being suspended, they're being disbarred, they're being uh, fined. Uh, they've done all kinds of, of, of uh, some egregious, some sort of subtle things against the client. Greg, how much tougher do, uh, do, you, do you need to be in policing the profession? I, I think we, Rob, have to be a lot tougher. Um, in fact, a lot of people don't know that uh, Avicus has uh, an internal disciplinary process uh, so that if Excuse you're... Me, can I just interrupt you and ask you how many people were thrown out of the profession in the past 12 months? Out of the profession itself? Out of the people that you've, uh, th that you've dealt with through your disciplinary process. Uh, I, actually, in the last 12 months, we've actually had none in the last 12 months. But I'd say in the last 36 months, we've had uh, three or four cases that have resulted in, in uh, removal from the association. Um, but does that prevent them from not, practicing? Not at all, and that's the problem. Okay. That's exactly the problem. It's the problem that we've brought forward uh, to legislators and, and regulators. And, and certainly, uh, you know, we, the regulations have to have a lot more teeth. I, I think as well uh, that if it was known, first, first of all, these are only individuals who are part of the association. So if you're not part of the association, you're not subject to any kind of disciplinary uh, process in terms of uh, holding out to these clients. So uh, I've looked at numbers in, in Quebec, for example, where they have a, a similar structure, where you have approximately 30,000 licensed individuals. And of those 30,000 licensed individuals, they have 600 investigations a year. And uh, out of that, they have about 60 hearings a year. So those 60 hearings normally result in some kind of disciplinary outcome. It could be suspension, it could be revocation, it could be you know, upgrade your education, it could be one of, an, of any of those or a combination thereof. So th that's the kind of direction we would move in uh, with respect to uh, a profession. As well, uh, you know, we would be looking for uh, restitution from the point of view of you know, fines and, and other kinds of uh, outcomes. You know, restitution, I, I had this on my list of topics to touch, but since uh, Susan raised it, it's a, great, it's a great question because when an individual has a problem with an advisor, they're not thinking in terms of, I want that advisor disciplined. They're thinking, I want my money back. I want right. the money I lost. I want the money I should have made. Um, would a professional um, organization of investment advisors be able to uh, create a restitution fund. And let me just add that the Law Society of Upper Canada has a fund like that. Lawyers contribute to it, and people who have been badly served by lawyers can make a claim. Will so, you do that? So, so let me say, Rob, on that, uh, I mean, these are each one of these issues are very complex, whether it's education, discipline, investigations, you know, restitution, and so forth. Um, and we have a lot of players out there, as I mentioned. Uh, we, we've got the MFDA, we've got IROC, We've got the securities commissions in, in each province. Uh, we have the insurance commissions in each province. Uh, we have pension regulations that oversee some of these individuals. So all of that has to work together in order for this to, to take effect. So there's a lot of work that would have to be done province by province to integrate all that. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, if, what we would like to see is a one-stop shop in each province where a complainant can go, file that complaint, 
and it's moved through the process expeditiously. You know, you, you get the hearing within six months. You don't, you don't have to wait four years and, and so forth. That, that's, that's the idea that we have. Well, and Robert, the other thing about the proposal is that you would have to belong to one of the approved organizations and you would have to have errors and emissions insurance. I mean, people make mistakes. Uh, and what protects the consumer is that if your advisor does make uh, a mistake in, in good faith, that make an honest mistake, that forget to check a box, uh, and that hurts the consumer, they can go and, and go to their errors and emissions insurance. We had a discussion about that this morning. It's what the Law Society has done. Interestingly, the Law Society has created this kind of really big self-funded pool to remind every lawyer that how much I have to put in depends on whether the not just me, but all the other guys are doing a good job. And it reminds the need uh, to, to, to hold, hold the highest standard. Susan, errors and omissions insurance, what does that mean to the end client who lost <coughs> I mean, a lot of money because of bad advice? Well, it's a huge amount of money out of the pockets of each lawyer each year. That's a big, uh, big, a big obligation. And also, the, 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 it's more of a straight line that if you go offside, that you could lose, you could be suspended, you could be paying a fine, you could actually lose your job, and your errors and insurance, uh, errors and uh, omissions insurance goes up through the roof. And so there are a lot of consequences, but why does that exist? And that's the issue of preserving the reputation of the profession. Now, you might not think that lawyers have a good reputation, but nonetheless, <laughs> that's the purpose of the Law Society, to try to maintain the integrity of the in, in the uh, in, in the public's eye of the profession. The public interest is served by having professionals who have this, uh, are part of a disciplinary process. And that's something that I invite financial advisors to introduce. So there's much more rigorous, much more clear cut. And I think that although there are only a few who go offside, if your own profession cannot get those people in line, the whole profession suffers. And you know very well that that is already happening, and we focus on that issue from the standpoint of Canadians not saving enough. You know, they don't put enough into their RSPs, they're not investing in, in many of your products, and so that's why we're saying maybe we have to mandatorily require them to contribute to an increased CPP, because they're going to fall on the public purse if they don't save for their own retirement. So in order to get more people investing, drumming up more business. The profession's own profile has to improve and, and professionalize and have much more accountability. Jerry, I'd like to just jump back to the issue of restitution. Yes or no, should that be part of the professional uh, standard for, the, for, the, for this business? As a regulator, I'd love to have it, um, but I don't think they're going to give it to me. That's why we have small claims courts and other various types. We have used it in the past. I can think of more than probably I have two or three occasions where we have taken disciplinary action, where we determined restitution would go a long way towards the client, and while we could not directly order it, um, we negotiated it. In one case, we I think we gave somebody a 15-month suspension, but said if they provided the restitution that we believed was owed to his clients, uh, we would bring down that suspension by up to eight months. And he actually elected to do it that way. The suspension came down, and, and so we found ways through the back door in dealing with that, but in restitution, it's, it's, it's a challenging thing, it's, especially on the life insurance side, it's not an easy number. I mean, to sit there and say, we think this should be this. It's one thing if we're looking at someone who's been charging DSC charges when they could have done no load, you can quantify the amount of it and say, okay, we think this is what you should give back to your clients. But on many products, it's just not that black and white. Um, and a lot of times, you know, restitution comes down to what somebody believes now, not necessarily what advice was being given six years ago. So one of the challenges as a regulator, when somebody comes to you with the six years of hindsight to say this was the wrong product for me, uh, yeah, you can say that, but the question isn't, is it wrong now? Was it wrong at the time the professional made the recommendation? What were the facts at the time? What was the client looking for? Um, and, and what was being recommended to them? So. A lot of times clients don't get that. They don't realize that, you know, when you come back to them and say, yeah, you know, we, we realize that this does not suit your circumstances right now. From the report, the records we've seen of the clients and talking to the, and talking to the client, we go, this was a reasonable recommendation. Was it the perfect recommendation? I don't think there's such a thing in most cases. So it's, there's a number of things of trying to get the consumer to understand what it is. But no question, when consumers come to us and complain, um, once we tell them that we cannot get their money back, a lot of people are not interested in pursuing that complaint. 
it, we're still left with having to deal with what we've got to determine whether or not a suitability issue resides there. But yes, I mean, it is one of the things that consumers are looking for and they don't want to go through the cost and, and the challenges of, of going to court. Do we, do we on this panel think that the current system of getting restitution for wronged investors is adequate? And then we'll start with you, uh, Jerry, and we'll just go right through here. Is it adequate? I mean, there's just so many different kinds of scenarios. Um, we certainly see situations where, and you know, we've talked about lawyers and everything else. I mean, on the life insurance side, you know, there are three parties to a transaction. You know, there's the agent, there's the company, and there's the consumer. Um, so all three have a part to play in this. Um, we can talk about raising the standard of, of, of agents, and certainly we've got to find some way to raise the standard of consumers. I've said for a long time, you know, there's three parties to, the, to an insurance transaction, and we regulate two of them. I've always said we should regulate the third one, the consumer. And if we regulated them, then we wouldn't have to regulate the other two. Um, because, and that's a weird thing for, for a regulator to say, but you know, we spend a lot of time uh, coming up with disclosure and, and ways in which the consumer can understand things. But clearly, in most cases, consumers do not take that choice. They don't read what you've got given them. Um, they don't deal with the things they're supposed to deal with. And that is a challenge. And the main reason they're not doing it is because they've gone to professional and they're relying upon that. The bad ones, of course, also realize that the consumer's relying on that and they can play that to their advantage. Um, but, you know, we have to look at other ways in which we're just dealing with these challenges. Um, and part of it is making sure that all three parties to the transaction are stepping up to the plate. And I'll give you one quick example of where we see some of the flaws. A number of years ago, we dealt, and this is just one case, but it's a good <coughs> example of it. We dealt with an insurance agent. We kicked them out of British Columbia in 2008. The council found that the person was not trustworthy, was not competent, and could not be relied upon to act in good faith in accordance with the usual practice. Uh, this individual was able to carry on business in another jurisdiction for two more years before that regulator dealt with them. But during that period, he was able to get a contract with at least one insurance company on a decision that was out there that everybody knew about. So how do you deal with that? Well, you know, what you're just talking about, this rogue agent, usually the way the rogue behavior manifests itself is an advice that creates a loss for the client. Now, Greg, do you, do you think the uh, is investor restitution, is the system as it is adequate, or would you want to address that going forward? I, th I, think the, uh, I think the problem out there today, Rob, is the complexity of the system. And I don't think that uh, clients really know what the proper process is for them to uh, ensure that they get some kind of reasonable outcome uh, when it comes to their, uh, to their complaint. It's, it's just too complex. They need a one-stop shop. They, they need to be able to file a complaint and then have that complaint uh, move through the system. But one thing I'd just like to pick up on just for a moment as, as I have the floor here is to say uh, a lot of complainants as well are very unrealistic. And uh, you know, when, you, when you look at the paper evidence at least, and that's the paper evidence, you look at the record, you see that those individuals were properly advised, they signed off on documents, um, and it's, it's during the questioning, of course, they say, well, I didn't understand what I was doing. Well, it, 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 that becomes very, very difficult. And we have found that those cases are very, very difficult. But um, I think if anything, if it could be a much simpler system, a one-stop shop system, that would be much more preferable for, for investors and for clients. Okay. John, does, do professional advisors, as part of their, their uh, Infrastructure, do they have a restitution option? People in this room do. It's the people not in this room that we well, have to worry very about. True. Very That's true. That's the thing. Yeah. Because if they belong to advocates, if they, you know, and, and almost all of them have a professional designation, they all agree they all have errors and omissions insurance. Um, and so honest mistakes are covered. For people who don't have errors and omission, honest mistakes are not covered. And that's not fair to the consumer. But when it comes to bad behavior, you know, the, the, the thing I look at it is, is it, it, just going on to that analogy I used about the minister not being responsible, the attorney general not being responsible or held by the, by the, the voters for the, for the errant lawyer or the minister of health for the errant doctor. In this group, what happens is because there is no self-regulation, it ends up becoming a political issue. People like Susan advocating for her members go to the Minister of Consumer Affairs and say, our seniors are being taken advantage. What are you doing about it? The minister starts feeling the heat from Susan and her cohort, goes and goes to see a guy like Jerry, who's the regulator, says, what the hell's going on here? And then, of course, what is the response? <coughs> well, it's obviously, there must be some gap in the regulation. We better have more regulations. Then we all sit around and say, why is there so much regulation? It's killing us. Look at all the costs when the, the, the solution to this is to set the standard high and ensure that those people who don't even belong to this organization don't cost us money and don't ruin the profession. 
And, and so that's the kind of issue that in, in the absence of being able to say to government, we know how to deal with this, you will get more and more regulation because there's no other option for the minister to answer Susan's question, what are you doing to make sure that our seniors are not being taken advantage of? And we've had that great example, a terrible example in Montreal. You know, a guy running around, no qualifications whatsoever, licensed by the province of Quebec, and, 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 and putting out a shingle and saying that he was all of these things and take, clipping people for millions of dollars. But if I may, yeah. there's a good example of really the opposite. I mean, Quebec is the only jurisdiction that regulates financial planners. He was not regulated, he was not licensed, mm -hmm. he was holding himself out as a financial planner. Right. You've got 200, 250 clients. It's the only province where somebody could have gone and looked to see whether or not he was qualified to do what he was doing. He wasn't. The clients never contacted him, went online to look. Most of them are seniors, none of the kids of the parents went and looked. And that's one of the challenges you're dealing with, getting consumers to know who they're dealing with. I mean, but it's Jerry, not, you it's have not, to, but you have to start somewhere. Yeah. Well, and, we, I and, think we have started a lot right, of things. I mean, most right. of the people, he was somebody who was nothing. I mean, right. he was basically calling himself something, um, and you can try and regulate the term. Well, that's part of the problem. You know, uh, these designations, we actually ran a poll with our members, and we ran a list of uh, designations, including some of the new ones, you know, seniors, planners, and so on, and some fake ones. And you know, a high percentage of them picked the fake ones yeah. as the ones that Sounded they were good. familiar with. So, <laughs> we, first of all, we had to stop that. Secondly, we have to have some clarity of where people can go. It is true that uh, average investors need to understand something about risk and something about their own personal responsibility for financial literacy, but they can't be expected to be much better than the average population, which as your own uh, research shows, uh, you know, has, has very limited financial literacy and only very limited interest in any financial literacy. So that's your population. Um, although seniors represent a, a, an interesting group, they are not by definition vulnerable as much as they are the group that happens to have the money. Secondly, there are going to be people who inherited wealth from a spouse and it was the non-planning you know, spouse. There will be people who lose some executive function as they get older, all of those things. Most importantly is that they have less time to recover the losses. So you have a different type of client that you're obliged to look at more carefully. So by definition, DSC investments are not appropriate. You know, the minute you see that, there should be a red flag because they're going to need that money, they need the liquidity, they need to draw money out of their rifts. This is not an appropriate investment by definition. So there are some rules you can put in place. Now, why is it important that there be source of re restitution? It's more that it is um, the stick, the hammer that says, and if you do wrong, and we find after all the complicated processes that you did do wrong, there will be a consequence. No one's saying that every time people can just hang their hands by their sides and run up to the bar and say, give me my compensation. No, they have to prove it. And that's part of the importance of the accountability standards to say, well, you know, the advisor knew more than the <coughs> investor by definition, otherwise they wouldn't have paid those grand fees. So therefore, that advisor owes some kind of responsibility to do right by the investor, to fill in that knowledge gap. And they also have this, you know, the best interest standards is interesting. There's a lot of pushback on that, but what is it used for? It's used for the moment that when all else fails, you go to court as an investor. Remember, this is a time at the moment where you've lost all your money, so you're in very poor position going into, uh, into court. Also at that time, you're trying to find a lawyer who understands the process, who is an expert to help you take you, your case to court. Remember what I told you about the lawyers who refuse to take tax? You know, you've got a small sample of lawyers who are actually expert at doing this kind of work. And so now you get to court, and one of the first things you have to do is prove that your advisor owed you a duty, right? That's what the best uh, interest standard is all about. It helps level the playing field. So would a professional advisor be bound by a fiduciary duty, Susan? Yes? As, uh, as a, right now, you mean? Are they no, or should they? No, should they? As, if we're talking Absolutely. about raising the bar, when we get to the bar, will, they be, will there be a fiduciary well, standard? Well, that is one of the hopes of the, of, of the professional model. There is, in most professions, any that is chartered, is in fact that they do have a best interest standard as part of their professional uh, conduct. Does a professional advisor have a fiduciary duty, John? Well, sure I, I came from the life side initially, so it was ultra various, right? Good faith. Uh, and after hearing the previous lawyers debate this issue, uh, 
makes me think as someone who used to be a legislator how important it is that that drafting would be. I have a better understanding of that. But, but I, I, I just think that the, the comment that I would always make, Rob, is yes, in that bad situation where you end up having to go to court, uh, that's going to be the standard. But we have to focus on how we don't get there in the, in the first place, which is behavior. And one thing I learned is, you know, you can't, uh, you can't make, you can't write a law and say everyone's going to be honest or everyone's going to be a crook. <coughs> most people are honest in most situations. Some people are crooks. The law tells you what you can't do. It doesn't tell you what you have to do. It tells you what you cannot do. We live in a free society. So when we start getting into the issues of behavior, the best group to determine whether or not that person is being uh, taken advantage of, the, the best group to say whether or not the surgeon did a good job were other surgeons. For lawyers to determine whether or not you met the standard of the profession were lawyers and in this business. Because what I find is I see a lot of these bandits hiding behind that they got the, the, the person to sign the forms because that's the legal standard. You signed it. And then you go to court and the judge said, well, is that your signature, Mrs. McGillicuddy? Well, yes, it is. Well, caveat emptor, ma'am. I mean, you signed it. So now we get the regulators trying to find out whether the guy's doing the paperwork. It's not whether the person did the paperwork. Everybody in the room here, if we looked at one of those cases, would probably immediately come to Susan's point, which was, that was bad advice. You know, the, what was motivating it? So that, that's what I'm more concerned about, is how do we raise the bar? And, and I think <coughs> the work that Advocus is doing is saying, <coughs> probably gonna be impossible to get 13 different, you know, 10 provinces and 13 territories all to agree to one big thing, and Jim Flaherty says, we're gonna do it. Where, what can we do practically at the provincial level to take these gaps where the bandits are hiding and get them out? And I, that's what I like about raising the bar, is you're not asking the government to do anything other than to recognize the good work of the industry to raise that, that, that standard. Uh, but, but again, I, I, I just think that people who are in this business are there for their clients, because they know if they aren't, they're not gonna be in business very long. The question is of the bandits, how much damage can they do before they get kicked out? Greg, what about the fiduciary standard for the uh, profession as you envision it? Right, I, I, I think, Rob, if we looked at the last panel, uh, it's a real indicator of how complex this issue is. I, I don't think it's black and white, and uh, there really is, in, in, in our estimation, as we look out there at the client base, there really is a spectrum of client need. And uh, there is no doubt that some clients are uh, extremely vulnerable, they're not knowledgeable, and they are fully dependent on that financial advisor. That's a fiduciary relationship, no doubt in my mind. Uh, on the other hand, you have clients who want to be very active and involved in the investment, yet they don't want to execute the order at the end of the day. They want to work with their advisor with respect to that. And in that instance, it may not be a fiduciary relationship. <coughs> so I, th I, th I think we have to be very careful uh, that we don't move in a way that we create unintended consequences. And if we're really clear in our minds that this is the outcome that we want, then let's make this decision. I don't think we're clear in our minds yet. That's the assessment we have uh, at the present time. Can, let's I just, talk about can I just add one comment to that? I'm, I, I sat through the last process and uh, the last discussion and heard these comments. I'm not clear where we're lacking. I mean, I'll give you an example. Six months ago, we dealt with a life insurance agent who recommended to his client that she invest in three uh, exempt securities. She was a 64-year-old woman, had about $250,000 worth of assets, excluding the house and put 165,000 to three real estate flyers out of Calgary where they all stopped paying off. Um, we are the insurance regulator. He did not sell an insurance product. We thought it brought into question his suitability. We thought the client was not sophisticated. We terminated his license for a year, put him under supervision when he came back, fined him, I think, $40,000, and charged him costs. Um, we didn't have any problem with jurisdiction. Uh, I don't think anybody does. It's pretty obvious that it's not appropriate, and we are quite easy and quite capable of dealing with these things now. Like, it sounds like a professional model, like a well-oiled machine, you took care of business. Yeah, and I think most jurisdictions have that authority now, and you know, there's nuances and there's gray areas, but when you see crap, you know it's crap, and you deal with it. Um, <laughs> or you should be dealing with it, right? right. Well, actually, people don't. You know, the uh, average investor has no idea what your designation is, or who it, what it means, and what organization looks after your discipline. The average investor just says, I have my $50,000 that I would like to turn into a million and a half, 
<laughs> and uh, you, the advisor, needs to identify those products that will do it. They don't know that you know, the person in the room can't sell them that other investment. They actually don't know that. Should they? Yes, they should. They don't happen to. So the industry itself, knowing that this is the case, needs to organize itself so that they can actually deal with the average investor in a fair way. You know, this, this business contract actually requires informed consent. They're handing over their life savings in many cases. There's some obligation coming back that says, by the way, this might make you a lot of money, but this is going to be extremely risky and you can't afford it according to your financial circumstances, even though I don't get that huge commission. You know, is there anything that requires each advisor to take that kind of attitude? And that's what we're talking about. Well, in the so case that when, we were dealing say, with, we said just that to him. No, we said, if you, not put, not you should have put in writing to your client no, no, no. that this is not appropriate. Self-regulation exists because professions always said to government, don't regulate us, we will regulate ourselves, we'll do such a good job, you won't need to come in. That was the point of self-regulation. When self-regulation fails, then governments will come in. For example, the national securities regulator that Jim Flaherty has pushed through and exists now among the, th you know, the two biggest provinces as far as this kind of work is concerned, also has attached to it an enforcement arm, an agency that will actually act as an investor champion and will also have the authority to refer matters to a tribunal that will have the authority to order restitution. That is on the books as a recommendation. We actually support that recommendation. So unless the industry says we can do better than that, that's coming in. Can you do better than that, Greg? Well, I think what's going to happen is that this kind of solution uh, that Susan's talking about is going to be integrated into our profession as well. That's what I'm saying. There's a, but we're talking about the national securities regulator. We right. all know that's never going to happen in this country. So <laughs> can you pick up the slack? I think we can do as well as that. I don't know that we can do better than that. Can you do as good as that? Can you I, do as good as, as what Susan I, described? I, absolutely. <coughs> I think, I think uh, if we are structured as a profession, uh, we are going to take care of our own. That's what we're going to do. And if they if they're need to be out of the uh, business, then they're going to be out of the business. It's as simple as that. Are there, are there, uh, do we need to toughen the, this, the standards in this, in, this, in this profession to get in to be an advisor? I mean, we all think it's a joke that anybody can call themselves a financial planner or an advisor outside of Quebec. It's ridiculous. Greg, how practically speaking can we make it so that it is tougher to get in and that only committed serious people get in? And we know this is a money business. It's going to attract the wrong element from time right. to time. How can you build something into the system to keep them out? So, Rob, we've put our minds to this. We don't have all the solutions yet. Uh, we have put our minds to this. I mean, there's a bit of a tension here because on the one hand, you know, as you raise those standards, are you going to reduce the number of advisors that are out there in the marketplace that are going to be available to consumers. And, and why is that important? It's important because, as I said this morning, uh, financial advice makes a difference in the uh, financial outcomes for Canadians. So Canadians need financial advisors. So we don't want to reduce the pool of financial advisors, yet we want them to have higher standards. So what we're going to, going to have to do as we move from where we are today to where we need to be tomorrow is we're going to have to evolve this profession and we're going to have to look at the existing cadre of financial advisors out there. I don't know whether it's a simple grandparenting, you know, if you just get a pass because you've been in it for 20 years or 10 years, that sort of thing, those details would have to be uh, answered. But I think moving forward, yes, that standard is, is very, very important. Uh, will it mean, a, uh, Jerry was sort of alluding to this, will it mean a mandatory designation uh, within three years of entering the business? Perhaps, again, that's gonna be up to the profession to, to determine. Uh, will there be um, an entry requirement? Uh, today, there's no entry requirement whatsoever. Uh, would it be a minimum of one year of post-secondary education? Maybe that's a good place to start. Nearly every Canadian you know, has that level of education, so that wouldn't be a, a high standard really to, for us to meet. So, so we think that those kinds of questions need to be asked, and we need to work on that together as a profession, moving it forward in the interests of Canadians. Jerry, I'm curious about your regulator's eye view on all of this. Um, do we need to raise the standards for people to get in and to call themselves a, a financial advisor or planner? You know, there's a number of things we're talking about here. There's financial advisors, financial planners, there's insurance agents, life insurance agents, there's mutual fund salespeople, there's secure stockbrokers, um, and they've got this blanket. Not every, not every stockbroker is a financial advisor or gives financial advice. Neither does every mutual fund person, and not does every life insurance agent either. We already have entrants for life insurance from mutual fund. 
for securities. Should, for the group of people who have none of those licenses, who want to be financial planners or financial advisors or whatever it is, should we have some kind of regulation there? I think that's a reasonable step forward. We see it in Quebec, there are other jurisdictions that are there. I've been doing this job between securities and here for 30 years. I have been on two provincial, one national, and three internal reviews to deal with financial planners, financial advisors. I've come to the realization you cannot regulate the name. For every name you want to regulate, somebody will find a new one. You have to regulate the activity. You have to decide whether or not it's appropriate that people can be financial planners and be so without any kind of regulation, whether it's financial planner, financial advisor, whatever you want to call them. Um, if you're going to allow that, then yes, I think you have to say, okay, if that's acceptable that somebody can be some kind of financial advice giver and not hold a license or a registration, you have to regulate that. There has to be a way to deal with it. Good luck with you. I've been doing it for 30 years. Never going to happen. Not in my lifetime anyway. Should, but it won't. Um, so that leaves you with everyone else who's left. Life people, general, uh, general of course, a separate group, but uh, mutual fund and securities. There are standards there. As for life insurance, could we raise the bar? I think so. As I said earlier, anyone can apply to become a life insurance agent. You only have to take one course. Once you've got that, there's really no further expectations on you. Is that acceptable? No. When half the people in this room, if not more, have a designation, a CLU, a CFP, um, how do you feel about the fact that you're having to compete with people who basically haven't finished high school, have taken the LQP course, and are able to go out there and market the same way you do? That's wrong. That is unacceptable. There should be a mentorship. There should be supervision. There should be a lot of things to get you there, including having to get some more education down the road. And the same should probably apply for mutual funds, but I'm not an expert in that area, so I don't know what's required. And the same should apply for securities. But let's be clear. You know, there is a difference between life insurance and securities. Life insurance involves contracts. It involves understanding products. You're not just selling investments, which everyone likes to talk about. You're selling insurance. Uh, I get asked the question a lot of times, should I buy my insurance online? If you're going to buy life insurance or health insurance or travel insurance, and my answer is very simple. If you want to buy insurance online, make sure you've never been to a doctor and you've never been sick, in which case you'll have no trouble taking the application because all your answers are going to be the right ones. Other than that, you should have an insurance agent giving you advice on how to complete the thing and go through insurance that way. And that's the difference between insurance and securities, a big difference between the two products. John, what about uh, tougher standards for, uh, for people who call themselves advisors and such? Um, do we need to make it harder to get into this business? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if, if uh, I tell my neighbor, you know what, you should get a will. I'm not a lawyer. If I turn around and I go, I went to the internet and I got one of those draft wills and I gave it to my lawyer, or my neighbor, I'm not a lawyer. But if I tell them, I'm going to get you a will, I'm going to draft it and pay me, I'm pretending that I'm a lawyer. It's like that dentist. Remember, there was the, the, the unlicensed dentist, I think, uh, recently. And the dentists were saying, the guy didn't meet the standard. So, so again, we have to figure out uh, working with the consumer so that they're educated. So, so what are we doing as a profession to tell people that they really do need to go to somebody who has errors in emissions insurance, that does belong to a code of ethics? that is working or has attained a, a, a professional designation, who is meeting a continuing education requirements. We, do we do that? No, that's what raising the bar is all about. It's all about saying this is the most important thing that we have, which is our reputation, and what are we doing to enhance that in the marketplace so it's obvious you know, that the guy who's working out of his basement maybe isn't a real dentist. Maybe. The, the guy who says, I'll, I'll get you a will, maybe isn't a real lawyer. That at least the people in this world understand the difference between uh, uh, you know, a, a professional accountant and a bookkeeper. Right? And, and what we have is we have bookkeepers in this, in this business with no insurance, with no professional designation, all, with no continuing education. And so that's, so who made sure that people understand the difference between the bookkeeper and the chartered accountant or the certified management accountant or the, or the chartered public accountant. The accountants did, not government, not the bookkeepers, the people in the profession. That was their job to enhance their profession and add their value to their clients. So it, it falls on the industry and that's why I, I, I'm here today because raising the bar is all about dealing with these obvious issues that need to get dealt with and it has to come from the industry. 
were clearly not obvious enough for some because it's still <laughs> taking a long time to move ahead. Now, the, uh, Rob mentioned earlier accounting, the accounting profession is about as territorial as any of the other professions, and yet they were able to merge. And the importance of merging was to create the layer that was professional, the layer that was not. In this profession, there's the layer that has all that education and the salespeople. That's the distinction. And the average investor is going to understand that distinction. And that's really fundamentally what's happening here. So you, you, you can have a single designation, you can have it mean something, and you can be, have it policed and monitored. So if you try to pass yourself off as a lawyer, the law society come knocking pretty fast. And, right. and so it should, and that's what the raising the bar proposal also proposes to do, so that, in fact, there's some policing of this. So that only those people who have the proper credentials and, and be unleashed onto the public would be allowed to do so. And anybody else who has the right to sell a product nonetheless has, continues to have the right, but the designation is that of salesperson rather than as advisor. The average person would understand that distinction. Susan, you've a couple of times talked about designations and accreditations, and I earlier on mentioned there's about eight of them. Are consumers completely baffled? Do they know, do they know to ask for the CFP or the RFP? No, or, no, no. they don't, whether how that relates to the PFP? No, they have no idea. They look at the card and it's got huge numbers of initials and they figure, oh, this person has a lot of credentials. And that's it, that's it. And when it comes time to rely on those credentials, that's when you know, the rubber hits the road and that's when they realize that those designations didn't mean a whole lot. Right. You can't prevent that unless you create <coughs> that avenue for uh, uh, professional accountability as quickly as possible. It's, it's really what it amounts to. It, this is part of the world now where message, you know, the news media covers the Earl Jones situation, a man who was not regulated, uh, who didn't have any kind of tag, and nobody checked. Nobody checked if he was allowed to, to keep uh, uh, taking people's money. And that kind of you know, unregulated unre environment scares people, and you're going to lose customers simply because people will just sit at home rather than try to invest. But in that situation, that's where the problem, it wasn't a regulated, he was in the one jurisdiction where he was regulated. Um, you can, the regulators can do so much, but if, you mentioned the, the, the um, dentist in British Columbia. I mean, he'd been going on for seven, eight years. Until the regulator knows about it, we cannot be in everybody's room. We cannot be in everybody's place. The problems that we're talking about here are always ones where they were not complying with the existing rules, let alone trying to add more rules yeah, well, to the process. Who was monitoring? Who was policing? And was there a place for the average uh, investor to say, you know, something's offside, it's, it's too good to be true, where's my 1-800 number to call to tell somebody, check into this thing? So, you know, we do live in a free society. People sort of carry on their professions, but if we have regulations, if we have self-regulations, let's enforce them. If we care about this kind of public interest, then let's collectively make sure that we can ensure it. You know, at the moment, things are falling through the, uh, through the cracks, and ordinary investors are, you know, it's basically a pox on all your houses. They have no idea which ones are the good guys. And the vast majority are good. I mean, that's yeah. the interesting thing. That's exactly why the industry True. has a vested interest, right, to push this. Because it's not like the perception that when someone, when one of these things goes viral and everybody thinks, as you said, Susan, a pox on all their house. They are the exceptions to the rule. But what is the reaction? You know, I, I think it was dentists who actually told their association about this guy because mm -hmm. they, they, had, <coughs> they had dental patients who stopped coming because they were getting a better deal someplace else. They said, well, that doesn't seem to be. And then the guy would do lousy work. Then they'd have to go to a real dentist. Mm -hmm. and, but it took years to find that person. Yes. There's, there's always going to be the exceptions, Greg. But, but to me, to, 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 to wash your hands and say that's going to happen isn't enough, right? And it isn't on you as the regulator. And it's not on the legislator. It's not even on the consumers. The person, the vested interest is the people in this room who say enough is enough. What do we have to do to stop this? Because these, these bums are giving everybody a bad name. But the bums are usually the non-regulated ones. I mean, at the that, end of the day, there are no question. I mean, I have a job because periodically insurance yeah. agents make mistakes and I have to deal with those. Yeah. Or the council has to deal with those. But you're right. It's a very small number. Most of them are mistakes. I mean, we're not, we're not being inundated with a lot of people who are ripping off the public. We are certainly dealing with some who are not doing as good a job as they could, need more knowledge, need more training. But across this country, certainly on the, on the insurance side, you know, we are not being inundated with examples of people who have been misled. Maybe they're out there and we haven't heard about them yet, 
But historically, when I look back at the decisions that we're making year after year, you know, two, three, maybe four life agents out of 13,000 every year get thrown out because we determine they are really bad. That's a pretty small number when you look at the overall number of people who are in this industry and, and for the most part are doing a better job, a very good job. And how do we get, I think our issue is how do we get the ones who are coming in better trained? Uh, pushing for designations, I'll agree. 1998, we said you should have a CLU. That should be the minimum requirement. I still believe that. I still think we should be saying to people, this is going to be your career. You should be qualified to do so. It is a profession. Um, and we should be continuing to push that along that way. There's an interesting question here, and I'll uh, throw it out to Greg. Um, has there been any thought given to a national public record of advisors who have lost their life licenses or, or, fine, or being fined for egregious and malicious acts? So uh, if you read through our uh, proposal, uh, we actually speak about that. We speak about a um, one national public database uh, that would be accessible, uh, that would uh, outline a complaints history, that would outline the credentials of, uh, of each advisor, and, uh, and probably their areas of expertise if you want as well. So uh, absolutely, Rob, that's being uh, considered as part of this proposal. Okay. Jerry, here's one for you. Only the provincial insurance regulators can raise the bar because they grant the license. Why don't you, they do it? Like the why, life company. Why don't we do it? Um, well, in British Columbia, we tried twice. There's, there's a, you can be certain there'll be a very strong opposition to any raising of the bar at the entry level. Um, the industry for a long time has been on the process of recruit as many people as you can. And, and I think I heard one insurance company say, you throw it against the wall and see what will stick. Uh, any discussion of moving away from that, um, really grinds the system down. Uh, as I said, we, we, took down, we went down the road in 1998. We went through with LLQP. We're now dealing with LLQP again, and the same comments are being said. You cannot create a barrier to entry. I don't think we're creating a barrier to entry. We don't create a barrier to entry when you say to doctors, you have to go to school for seven years. You have to be, do residency and everything else. I mean, otherwise, I would have used that argument a long time ago, and it could have been the doctor which my mother wanted. Uh, but I wasn't going to get to the school. We have to establish and agree that there is a minimum standard that you have to have if you're coming into, this in, into the life insurance industry. What it is, it should be education, more education once you're in, uh, sponsorship uh, or, or um, uh, supervision or something along those lines, mentorship going along that way, until you've earned that point where you've got to the point where you know what's going on. It's a very complicated industry, and it's getting more complicated. The LLQP is not enough, and I'll be the first one to say that. That is not adequate, and I don't think it's meeting the consumer's expectations. Um, maybe we go to disclosure, maybe we say it's fine, okay, we're gonna, not going to raise the bar, but you've got to tell, tell your clients, you can write, hi, my name's Jerry Mateer, I passed the LOQP yesterday, before that I was the plumber, uh, before that I was doing something else, so I'm now your financial advisor, and how do you feel about that? Um, I don't know that that's the right answer either, but certainly there's got to be something more involved. Well, and Rob, as a, as a recovering politician and a former <laughs> cabinet minister, <laughs> what I can tell you on this is that the decisions that are made by a government to say to the regulator, you're raising the bar, right? That decision is, is made. Those are net sum decisions. Politicians look at that and say, as Jerry just said, people are saying we should do that. No, these people are saying we shouldn't do it. Yes. So if you want to get something done, I said, what I like about the raising the bar is you get, you get everybody who actually represents the vast majority of people in the industry who want to see the bar raised. And you go to the politicians, and say, you may hear from a, a bunch of people who want to have a lower standard, but all of us think there should be a higher standard. That's a pretty good parade to convince a politician, cabinet minister, and regulator to get in front of. If you don't do that, then they have to look at the policy, who's for it and who's against it. You want to show up and say, you know, the vast majority of people who care about their clients and customers want this to happen. That is a winning proposition if you put that in front of government, as opposed to airing your dirty laundry and this group doesn't like that group. So it's how to get the different groups together in the model to say, why don't we just all agree with this? Then together, united, go to government and say, this is in the best interest of your constituents. And, and I'll support that. When we were trying to bring in the LOQP into British Columbia in 2000 or 2001, there was an awful lot of lobby going on to the government to prevent it from happening and preventing us from going forward with it. Uh, after, I think, three and a half years of discussion that went on and on, we finally went to four or five senior life insurance agents in our province and said, are you opposed to this? And they said, no. We said, then why don't you go to the government and tell them that this is what you want? And they did. And four days later, the reg was passed, and we had it. And I agree. 
you know, you, you're, this is your industry. You're the ones that exactly. need to be there. And they're not hearing that voice. They hear the people who are saying no. We always hear that. You always hear the people say no. You never hear the people say yes. It has to be made very clear. Uh, but there's also a new voice in that uh, whole dilemma. You know, ministers want to hear from, you know, uh, groups that sort of pack together and say, well, you know, this re re represents a critical mass of your constituents. Uh, one of the voices, of course, are seniors, older Canadians who vote all the time. And part of our work at CARP is to make sure they understand what they're voting about. And in this kind of situation, when the profession is sufficiently complex, that it is, you know, people look up bleary-eyed and wonder where they start. So that's what we try to do. What we try to do is to bring it down to brass tacks so that they know that if the profession gets itself aligned and professionalized and disciplined and puts in the regulatory, self-regulatory um, rules, that they have a better chance of having a safe investment and getting the money back at the end of, of the end of the road. And if they understand that, and then we said, and here are the politicians who agree with you, and here are the ones that don't, you can recognize that that can be a very powerful force as well. I have the scars, yes. She's absolutely <laughs> right. <laughs> On the topic of scars, uh, John, as a, as a recovering, as you say, politician, here's a question I'll, I'll throw to you. Does the professions model need to be national in order to be effective? What if Quebec insists on maintaining its own structure? Well, it's the nature of our confederation, of our partnership. Uh, I, I just think that in Canada, we can always find an excuse not to take action. But uh, history shows that eventually, we realize that we have to take action. And I, you know, uh, I believe, as many people do, that having, not having a national security regulator makes us the laughing stock of the G20. Uh, you know, Jim Flaherty is, is, is not my political uh, friend, but he is a, a friend of mine. I give him all the kudos in the world. He tried to get it nationally, couldn't get the provinces on side, but he's, he's set the train in motion where eventually you're either going to be part of the, of the big national system or you're not going to sell a lot of securities in Prince Edward Island, right? So you, this is just the nature of Canada. So I, I believe it should be national, Rob, but if we can't get there in the first step, that's no reason not to take the steps required because the vast majority of the industry is you know, within 500 miles of right here. <coughs> Greg, what about you? Do you feel you have to be national or are you willing to go it alone on a province-by-province on a province basis? The, it, the reality is we're gonna have to go province-by-province. Province. I mean, you know, we, we would be here 100 years from now yeah. if we were trying to do it nationally. It's just not, it's just not gonna happen. Uh, you know, we've had all the conversations over the last couple of years and a lot of political will there but there's no, there's no structure. The structure is at the provincial level. Uh, that's where we have to get the job done. Jerry, I'd be curious to have you jump in on that, uh, given that you're, you know, you're, from your regulatory point of view. Um, can, we, can, can BC do it alone and no other province has it? Does it well, have I've always thought I could do it alone, but in reality, <laughs> I know I can't. Um, I think, realistically, you know, one regulator over 13, I think that's gotta be an easier choice. Um, but my job is to regulate life insurance agents in British Columbia. Uh, if the government wants to make a national regulator of it, I think that would be obviously the way to go. I think it's less bureaucratic and there's more opportunities. Right now we have a patchwork kind of regulation system as it applies to life insurance. We spend a lot, I mean, I think at the moment with the LLQP that we're now working on, it'll be the first, once we complete it, it will be the first standard of education across the country. So everybody coming into the industry will be at exactly the same level. And that'll be the first time that's happened in well, I think ever in this, in this mm -hmm. country. So we are getting there in spite of ourselves, um, but I think realistically, certainly that would be choice. But there is not any discussion on a national uh, insurance regulator. Um, there is a securities one, and I guess they've got to fight one by the time. Yourself, why not? You know, when you're talking about standards of behavior and standards of conduct, you know, as an, you know, on behalf of investors, we don't much care how you get to a national standard, whether you have to have all the provinces cooperate or whether you have the federal government impose the national standard, right? All you need to know is that as I cross each provincial border, it's exactly the same standard of care. You know, surely we can do this. All the other regulated professions have that promise that doctors in one province are approximately the same as doctors in another province. Lawyers too, even lawyers and accountants, generally speaking, their professional conduct and responsibilities and standards of practice are about the same. We Susan, don't need to be, to be identical. So let's not get trapped with the idea that we've got these 
you know, territorial uh, wishes. In actual fact, you know, uh, Canadians, when you talk about the Canadian public interest, you have to have a national standard. However you get there is really, is, uh, is in the detail, but that's what you should be aiming for. Rob, could I just uh, add Please to do. this point, Susan, that uh, however, if you go back to the analogy of the doctors, the lawyers, the engineers, their professions are still regulated province by province sure. by province. And what's happened is they have gotten together as, as right. provincial professions and created this sort of national standard, if you want. This is what would happen with financial advisors as well. That's going to take some time, but that's, that's certainly the, the vision. And following up with what Jerry was saying, how important it is that you, you, in Canada, the history is a province makes the tough decision to do something that is the best in the country. It doesn't take too long before a bunch of other governments, when they're doing their analysis, say, well, how come they have that in BC? Like, how come it's illegal to text uh, while you're driving in Ontario, but not in Alberta or whatever, right? So in other words, it, 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 it was a provincial issue, but it's amazing how if one takes a leadership, the others over time politically have to get in line if, it, if it's considered to be in the public good, because politically they, they can't justify in this province why there's more consumer protection or better standard or, or better laws in that, in that province versus that one. So you can't use the, well, let's get all to agree as the standard. Uh, your new standard will be something that every other legislature will look at as saying, well, that's the gold standard. If someone else has a gold standard and you move it because that, that does move the yardstick. Now, I, we, we have a couple minutes left, and I want to just refer back to something that happened in the previous panel. Someone said that they recalled being at an advocacy meeting many, many years ago and talking about raising the bar and increasing the level of professionalism, and here we are talking about raising the bar and increasing the level of professionalism. Let's flash ahead 10 years. Uh, I want each panelist to give a quick account. Where do you see this profession, this business, in terms of having raised the bar? Will it be higher in 10 years? Start with Jerry. I would hope so. Um, I would think, you know, the industry keeps evolving. We have to keep evolving as regulators. I mean, I, I'm a certainly believe that the industry should drive it, not the regulator. I think when the regulator is driving where the industry is going, you've got problems. Um, you really don't want me deciding how your industry should be run. Uh, I come from an organization that is an industry body. My board members are industry people, so as we're going forward, we are dealing with it with industry feedback. Um, but I think we've got to be a lot clearer on what we're talking about here. You know, you have the regulation of mutual fund people, you have the regulation of stockbrokers, you have the regulation of life insurance people. Uh, we've talked around this conversation today, we talked about these sort of gray people who are financial whatever. Um, there are not a lot of people out there who are acting in this gray area without some kind of license. They are being regulated. What we need to do is say, okay, what are we going to regulate? If it is financial advice, we accept the fact that life insurance agents give financial advice. Do we call them financial planners? No, we don't. We say in our rules that if you have not got a CHFC or a CFP, you cannot hold yourself out that way. I think we need to be more clear on what we're expecting people. We need higher standards when they come in. And if we're going to talk about the financial issue, whether it's through the insurance councils or the superintendents, the MFDA or anybody else, Let's deal with the activity, let's determine what they can and cannot do and be clear about it. Um, to go down the road of, of looking at you know, what your proposal is saying has a lot of merit to it and I think it needs to be looked at, but let's be clear, if, if, if advocates can be a regulator or a professional body and, and uh, IROC can be a professional body and MFD can be a regulator, you know, we've already got 13 provinces with one securities and one insurance regulator, that's what, 26, there's a national 27. How many more do we add in and, and is it going to be effective? I don't know that it can be that way, but I do think the professional associations play a big role in setting the standards, creating more education, pushing for greater education and more professionalism in the industry, and then if, if there really truly is an issue with people who are falling through the cracks who are not being regulated, then yes, we got to come up with an answer for that and deal with that as well. Okay, thanks, Greg. Uh, so, j yep, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Greg. I want, I want Imagine that, we're taking, imagine that we're all going to refer back to this moment 10 years from now. Uh, do you, can, you, can you give us some sort of a indication of your level of confidence that advisors are going to be regarded as a, a true profession in 10 years' time? Yeah, I think 10 years is a, a reasonable time frame, Rob, and I, and I do think that we will look back uh, with, a, with a lot of uh, uh, positive feelings that we've made a lot of progress uh, with respect to this issue. Uh, you referenced this meeting from 10 years ago. And you know that was a, a meeting of financial advisors within their association. Uh, we went public a year ago uh, with this proposal. We have uh, discussed it in, in most of the provinces throughout the country. 
with a lot of regulators, a lot of legislators, a lot of members, a lot of non-members, and uh, a lot of members of the, uh, the media and the public at large, and, and have made a lot of progress in that short period of time. So uh, I believe we will make a lot more progress. Uh, Jerry's mentioned a, lo a lot of challenges in there. I'd love to answer all those, but it's going to take 15 minutes, so I won't do that. But uh, yes, it's complex. Uh, but just because it's complex doesn't mean we should just abandon it. We, uh, we have a vision. I think we can move together uh, and, and make, it, make it happen. Uh, we need everyone on this stage and everyone in this room to, to help support it, to help move it forward uh, without consumers, without governments, without regulators, without the media. Uh, it's not going to happen. So, so we need everyone uh, doing the heavy lifting. Susan, how optimistic are you about where this is going? You know what? Ten years is too long. You know, the first boomer turned 65 last year, and that population, together with all those uh, older than them, represent 42% of the Canadian population. This is a group of people who no longer think doctors are gods. They might see a cardiologist or an oncologist, they will also check to see how much research they've done, what papers they have cited, whether they have a good reputation. They're not gonna stand for a profession that continues to sort of say, well, catch me if you can. They will start sorting through. They don't have that much time to wait. They wait 10 years and lose money during those 10 years? I don't think so. They want better standards right now, and it's gonna happen quickly. With the exchange of information, the way news travels, the way our information systems travel, and so on, you won't have 10 years. You have to get started now. You should do it within our attention span. John, take us out. What do you, what's your level of optimism? I'm with Susan on this. You don't have 10 years. You have a plan that's practical, that can be implemented. That's raising the bar. You actually have that. Right? Everybody here, it's costing you money not to do it. Right? And it's hurting your clients. Because if you're spending money on that, you're not spending money on, on your clients. Right? So it's not good for your business. That, so the trend that you're on, I don't think is a good trend. My, my partner who bought me out when I went into cabinet, I mean, I can't believe the percentage now that he has to spend in his practice on regulation. So I get the idea that this is going through the roof and you have to come up with a practical way to stop it. And what I like about raising the bar is it's practical. You can do it. It's not like, well, somebody else is going to do it. But you know what's missing? The consumers want you to do it. I think the regulators want you to do it. I think the politicians will gladly. The question is, do the people in the industry care enough to get off their duff and demand it? Right? So that if the, this professional designation doesn't agree with that professional designation, the members who have the designation, well, we don't care that you guys can't work it out. We have to do this. And so I think it's there. I think it just takes some leadership uh, and it needs a, a, a deadline. All good things need a deadline. And then move forward. Because I think the, uh, I think, uh, well, thanks. Uh, I had one person vote for me, and I, I know what that is. <laughs> I brought in the HST, so I know exactly how that feels. And they, uh, I did. No, the, uh, so, I, so I think it's there, and, and it's a great opportunity uh, because, uh, because the alternative is ugly and expensive. All right, well, in this panel, we all agree. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.